that's the wrong answer. Go back and do your project again and don't come back until you've changed. Of course not. Uh, should I say, oh yes, you've changed. You just haven't thought about it enough. Now I'm going to go and close the door. <laughs> and when you've thought through what you've changed, please tell me. Seems a bit odd. Or do I say, not a problem. You'll change soon enough. Please come and tell me when you do. Or do I say, oh, you haven't changed? Well, don't worry about it. Not everyone does. You did good work. Thanks very much. All the best to you. I was thinking about those options during the break while I was down on the street in front of University Hall, and a bus went by. This is how life gets interesting. It's public transit, and the bus was uh, almost covered in NUS uh, marketing language. So there's a group of uh, presumably NUS students smiling as the bus goes by on the side of the bus. Do you know this? People know this one? Well, maybe someone from NUS could get the exact wording of the slogan on the side of the bus. Anybody know it? That's at the back, yeah, let's, which is the one I really wanted anyway. So on the side it said something like, we mean to change the world from within. And just as I was trying to get all of that, the bus was going away, and on the back it did say, the change is me. Well, now, I, th I thought I was okay with saying, look, not everybody changes. It's okay. On you go. Thanks for coming. Uh, and then I read that. And this is now where I stand. Thanks to your comments. Thanks to other things that I've heard. I believe we are in the transformation business. There, I said it. Might not have said that in public before. I believe we are. However, the nature of that change, that's the student's business. To dictate the nature of that change, I think, is unethical, at very least paternal, uh, and I don't think I'm in that business. But the idea that we are not here to provide opportunities for significant growth and change in our students, for me, isn't on. The bus was right, I think. Now I have to think about the implications of that for assessment, for other ethics. I need a nap. <laughs> Thank you so much for stimulating those, uh, those and other thoughts. Thanks. Thank you. It was a great morning, and we look forward to an equally valuable afternoon. If I could very briefly <clears throat> introduce our second uh, keynote speaker, Professor Mick McManus from University of Queensland. He is currently the Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic there. He was recently appointed that position in, in uh, December of 2011. He held a number of other senior leadership roles at the university, including Dean of Academic Programs and Academic De Deputy Vice Chancellor International, Executive Dean of uh, Faculty of Biological and Chemical Sciences and Head of the Department of Physiology and Pharmacology. He served on the board of a number of research institutes, spin out companies, and was chair of the Queensland Australian American Fulbright uh, Awards Committee. So without further ado, new media literacies and personalized learning. Thanks, Lavinia. Right, everybody hear me? Right. Well, um, we got into this area um, actually over the Christmas break. And um, Phil Long, who uh, came to us from MIT, we were talking about uh, MIT's op open courseware and uh, how do we actually at UQ do something in this particular space? And are we actually open not only to uh, other parts of the university, uh, but to the community within uh, Queensland, but broader to the globe. And so we've uh, now gone down a, a pathway where we've started to try and uh, look, at, look in detail at what's going on in the university in relation to uh, what we can generally call e-learning. Now, in this uh, talk, what I want to show you is some of the backroom stuff that's actually going on at the university. So. I'm really interested in trying to get your thoughts about where you are, where you're trying to go, as well as for you to see what we're currently doing. Now, um, there's a saying um, in politics that uh, all politics is local, and this was uh, coined by Tip O'Neill, and uh, who used to be the Speaker uh, of the US House, Rep uh, House of Representatives. And um, basically, it says that politicians really need to make sure 
they, they work for their local constituency and not uh, travel around the world. And uh, then if you were to apply a similar type of scenario to education, you'd say all education is local, but local now means global. And I think the MOOCs are now putting that out there and challenging us, is really education, is education a, a global pursuit? So if we look at some of the key trends in education, so we've got a global population growth where we'll go from seven to nine billion uh, over the next 40 years. And I think one of the hidden sort of context of uh, Coursera, for instance, and uh, Daphne Collar, who's got a really great uh, TED talk, is that they are interested in making available the best teachers, the best courses from the best universities to the globe. And so there is this context that, but it's not really spelled out in, the, in great detail, but there is a context there that a university education will be seen as a universal right. And I think that's something that I think uh, as first world countries we need to be very cognizant of. Because recently at a meeting in Korea where I was, two of the objections that were raised to a lot of the, the discussion that was going on uh, came from South America and Africa and that the need for the first world to be cognizant of the fact that there are other parts of the world that need access to the knowledge base in order to grow their economies. And so I think this is a very important issue. A, a globalised economy will move jobs across national boundaries and education will need to mimic these changes. And I'll come to that in a minute and give you a demonstration. Disruptive economic ups and downs, and we've all been through those with the global financial crisis, will result in unstable employment situations and the quest for talent will intensify and mobility will be the norm. So I think people will just move around a lot more. And you can just see the different people that are in this room where they've moved from different countries to where they are today to do their jobs. And so this, this will be ongoing but it'll get faster. New knowledge and technologies are entering the marketplace at an alarming pace reducing the useful half-life of degree programs. So knowledge, you know, will become dated as students move their, through their particular programs. And pro probably the greatest attribute we can give students is their capacity for continuing professional development. And then we've got these other big challenges which are going to bring us all together and break down borders because big issues like climate change, energy and water sustainability will require interdisciplinary and transnational solutions. So it will have to be a global solution if we really are going to have uh, a sustainable planet moving into the future. So if you're now going from that context at the global level where we're going from seven to nine billion, what's actually happening in Australia at the present time and what are some of the drivers? And this comes from the uh, federal government in Australia. And their expansion of higher education is driven by increased uh, uh, productivity and social inclusion. And the targets are by 2025, 40% of all 20, 25 to 34 year olds will have a qualification at bachelor level or higher. And by 2020, 20% 20 of higher education enrolments at undergraduate level will be people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. So it's again, it's how do we make education available at a national level that sort of mimics what I'm talking about at the global level. And the strategy is to move to a, uh, move to a demand driven system of funding for bachelor degree places so that there are no caps on places in universities. How well are we doing? Well at the moment you can see that that, uh, that target of 40% is really, I think, quite a conservative target. Uh, and at the present time, we're roughly at 35% and we're travelling at about an increase of 5% each five years. So clearly we should get to that target of 40% and beyond it without any difficulty. So again, there's this uh, basic driver coming from politicians that education must be available uh, to every student or every person uh, in society. So just uh, for your information, there are two recent uh, 
reviews out of the Australian system, one on the uh, University of the Future. It's an Ernst & Young report on Australian universities. It says the current Australian university model, a broad-based teaching and research institution with a large base of assets and back office, will prove unviable in all but a few cases. So it's basically saying that the educational model that we've currently got doesn't have a long-term future. Now, I think it's more of, more of a marketing tool for Ernst & Young than what that's actually saying, but nonetheless, it is challenging the system to say, you know, what's actually going on inside the walls of an education system. And Clark Kerr, in his book, uh, uh, The City of the Intellect, Clark Kerr, the former president of the University of California system, uh, said um, there are two institutions in society that have, uh, had, uh, that have been there for, the, for uh, a long time. And he said, one is the church and the other is the university. But he then went on to say that it's easier to change the church than what it is the university. And, and to a certain degree, there is, a, there is truth in that. And then there's that other American uh, saying about that uh, changing an education system is like moving the cemetery. You don't get a lot of support from the locals. <laughs> and so I think this is pretty true in our system and it's probably mimicked across the globe. Then there's a uh, report, uh, Australia in the Asian Century. And this, uh, Julia Gillard, our Prime Minister said, Predicting the future is fraught with risk, but the greater risk is failing to plan for our destiny. So basically, this is saying that Australia needs to move more of its focus towards the Asian area. So what can we sort of make of that, some of those statements? If you look at a report from the Royal Society on knowledge networks and nations, and this figure, uh, 2.1 looks at the increase in the proportion of the world's papers produced with more than one international author from 1996 to 2008. And so that, if we just look at that, we've gone from 25% to 35%. So clearly global collaboration is going up and it's just, this is just going to track up more. And so our education system, if we truly are research intensive universities, where our education is informed by our research, then our education systems also have to mimic this type of behaviour. And if you, um, this, this is another uh, um, a figure from that uh, same report, and looking at world, world knowledge centres, this is looking at the top 20 publishing cities, 2004 to 2008, and their growth since 1996 to 2000. And basically, what it's saying is that if you look now towards Asia, that where we've got a, um, a red dot, we've got an increase of 20 places. If we've got a yellow dot, it's an increase of 10 to 20 places. And the blue dot is an increase of 5 to 10, and the others are, are remaining relatively constant. So we can see that there's been tremendous growth in China, in Taiwan, in, North, in South Korea, um, in, 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 this, in Japan, tremendous growth in publications. Uh, and so what, what I'm sort of looking at this and saying that essentially the knowledge centres of the world are also moving, but it doesn't mean to say that these still are, are not important, they're very important. But nonetheless, this is becoming another critical centre and that report on the Asian century really says that Australia needs to have a more focus in these particular areas. So, when you talk about sort of increasing um, uh, participation at universities, you're talking about massification. And so when I went to university, it was probably an elite system. Then in Australia, it went to massification. And now with the target of 40%, which could be 50%, it's more or less getting towards universal access. And so when you go into a class, you sort of, I got this out of one of my son's old books where basically in a class you've got a whole lot of students, but where's Wally? Where's that, that student that you, you should be taking into consideration? And I think Ken Bain in his book, 
uh, what, what the best college teachers do summed it up quite well when he said, my strongest feeling about teaching is that you must begin with the student. As a teacher, you do not begin, with, you do not begin to teach thinking of your own ego and what you know. The moment of the class must belong to the student, not the students, but to the very undivided student. And uh, Bain quotes uh, Paul Barker when he says, you don't teach a class, you teach a student. So how do you do that when you've got 300 or 400 students in a class? What are the techniques that you use and how can these new media literacies help in that particular context? So we started a journey at the university at the beginning of the year where we wrote a paper called A Learning Community in a Time of Standardisation. How does UQ get there? We then moved on to develop a strategic blueprint for supportive technology enhanced learning. And then we've, uh, we got caught up also, like everybody else, in this discussion about massive open online courses. And I'll come to that at the end of this presentation. So, um, online digital content versus the lecture. So we, we can say a number of things. Digital, uh, uh, online digital approach allows for individualization of learning, allows for students to, be, to practice independently or collaboratively. It produces a, a, an unrivaled source of analytics. And I think we're yet to really uh, mine this particular area and really understand what students are learning. It allows for the lecturer to customise interventions and provides an array of formats to display information that cannot be done in a regular classroom. So obviously these are all the very positives about using a digital approach. There are also sort of negative, but, but I'm just going to focus on some of these at the present time. Now, this is going into some of the backroom stuff at UQ. We, our learning management system, this is the main UQ learning e-learning systems. We have uh, Blackboard uh, as our learning management system. We use Echo 360 as our lec lecture capture process. We have the virtual classroom, uh, uh, classroom through Adobe Connect. And we have uh, uh, text matching and marking through Turnitin. Now, What's happening to our students and what's, what's the student behaviour? Because I often go around the, uh, the campus and one of the first questions I ask a, a lecturer is how many students were in your class at the beginning of the uh, semester? How many are in there now? And so I've got a lot of sort of anecdotal information that says that basically quite often halfway through a semester you can have half the students that you started out with. And so when we look, so what I then went and had a look at some of the data, we do a survey in week 12, which is called the Student Evaluation, or evaluation of Course and Teacher, or CCAT. And we, we basically see that there's a, been a real drop off uh, in, in the number, uh, if you take this as reflecting the number of students in the, in the class. And, there are question marks about that, but nonetheless, let's just take it as a proxy and you can see that there's quite a drop off. And these are the number of students that are sitting the exam in week 15. So clearly there are, students are making decisions, and I've got, got this from a lot of people around the university, to actually use the ECHO 360 uh, uh, lecture capture process then to go and hear the lecture uh, first hand. And when we look again, we can get data from the transport, the Queensland transport, that tells us how many students are coming to university uh, on a particular day of the week. And we can, we can plot that on a graph. And we can also, uh, you can see there, and it's going down at the weekend, and you can see that we can also plot the number of students that are ac uh, accessing Blackboard. And again, what we're, sa what we're uh, saying is that from this data, more faculty or professional staff and students use UQ's online learning system each day during semester, then come to campus. So again, we're seeing basically uh, this online approach and students getting the information in different ways, changing behaviour at the university. 
We've then sort of gone and uh, done a survey of our students where we got a, uh, basically 5,457 respondents. And out of this, we can conclude that 98% of our students own a smart device with Wi-Fi and a browser. I was very surprised, and Apple would be very happy to see that 46% of our students actually have an iPhone. But uh, a significant, so basically, we have a significant opportunity to leverage in-class interaction and collaboration tools. And so how do we move down that pathway in a more constructive way than what we currently are? The survey also looked at <coughs> the facilities and services uh, uh, accessed or assessed uh, weekly uh, by students. And what we can conclude from this is that uh, UQ students use more of our learning, use our learning management system more often than they do Facebook or our library databases. And you can see about 80% here using Blackboard, Facebook about 74%. And if you come to our uh, library databases, we've got about, uh, um, if I can, about 69%. Uh, so you can see that there's been a, a big shift to these particular tools and what is that, what's that doing to how students are learning at UQ? And this just shows you some of the data. Basically, it's showing Blackboard usage during semester one, 2012, and that roughly combining, combining staff use with student use, Blackboard now accounts for over 30 thousand discrete users on, on some days, and basically on mo most days, with about 80,000 logins. So this system is being used extensively at the university. If we look at Adobe Connect, which we've just uh, put out now to, to all uh, schools in the university, and, and it basically it connects for lectures, tutes, seminars, admin, collaboration and recruitment. And that just shows you again that there's been, over the first year of its use, a dramatic increase from first semester to uh, second semester. So basically when we look at what's happening in the back room, Blackboard Mobile Access, uh, Blackboard mobile access to Blackboard has nearly quadrupled. The average total number of discrete students per day has increased from 25,000 to 28,000. Uh, in over 30,000 including staff. Uh, video file use increased from just over 8,000 a month in 2010 to 45, nearly 45,000 per month in March of this year. And the number of general file downloads has doubled from 860,000 to uh, 1.6 million. And PowerPoint downloads have more than doubled from 88,000 per month to 216,000. So the general tool usage per course increased. Online assignment, uh, online assignment usage increased from 40% uh, uh, to 64% uh, of courses. So these systems are getting a lot of use within the University of Queensland system. Then if we go to where students get a lot of their other information from, it's from the library. And if we just look at what's happening in the library, circulation of printed material continues to decline. So in 2001, we had 1.5 million. We're now down to 824,000. Use of licensed e-resources e, uh, continues to increase, and it's been a very dramatic increase, where we've gone from 90,000 to 1.5 million. So about a 15-fold increase. Full text article downloads have gone from uh, 6 million to 9 million. And uh, in-person uh, services such as reference test inquiries are going down. Uh, our Ask It inquiries, which is our inquiry desk, has increased significantly. And the use of li library spaces uh, continues to hold up because essentially what we've done is we've moved most of the books out of a lot of the libraries and now they've now become learning spaces. And then if you go and look at this concept of openness, and you've, if we go back to the first president of Johns Hopkins University, Daniel Gilman, 
He said, it is one of the noblest duties of a university to advance knowledge and to diffuse it, not merely among those who can attend the daily lectures, but far and wide. And I think this is what the MOOCs are speaking to, and Gilman had this quite some time ago. And Johns, Johns Hopkins University in the American context was probably their truly first research university. So open, open access institutional repositories, we know that these are now littering the globe and you can see that they're, they're, they're very prevalent uh, really no matter where you go. And that we're now mo moving into open textbooks and this is coming out of Rice University where you see physics, sociology, biology and con uh, concepts biology. So very much moving into the open domain. So <coughs> I was able to get this little survey that was done in the medical school and it basically asked how important is physically attending lectures and tutorials to your learning process? This question is intended to gauge your learning style. And 19% I would be, I would, uh, be better off doing anything through e-learning. So clearly there's a significant group that think that they can get most of it just through e-learning. I learn better through physically attending lectures and tutorials. Another significant group. So there are different cohorts. I would like the chance to ask questions and hear questions from the lecturer. I am a self-directed learner and learn best at my own pace and I'm a f I'm, I like physically being at lectures and tutorials but also like the online learning which is by far the dominant group. This is where I try to get my son basically and he likes to be uh, over here. So everybody's a little different but these are some of the behaviours that are going on within our student body. What are some of the types of features that, what features of e-learning do you, ha do you stroke have, have you found beneficial to the outcomes of your education? And clearly these voiceover PowerPoints have been very popular and sometimes I think Blackboard is just a, a glorified system of distributing PowerPoint presentations. But nonetheless, it's very popular. Our Echo 360 uh, process has been incredibly popular with our students. Online quizzes are growing in popularity. Virtual learning environments like Blackboard, uh, certainly well received. Um, submitting assessment online, again, is, is being well received, but we would like that to be much higher than what it currently is. And so it shows you those couple of slides. That's a group of students out of our medical school as to what they think is important. And some of the things that sometimes I think in this process we tend to ask the lecturers, but we don't ask the students. So out of all that, it got us thinking about what do we really need to do? And so, oops, we've, designed, we've uh, then set out to develop a strategic blueprint for support of technology enhanced learning. And I'll just go through some of the uh, issues in that particular area. So we asked, a group of academics, what does it take to learn? What is happening when our students are learning well? What do we most value about our current teaching and our students' ways of learning? And we got an interesting set of responses. So what are our students learning well? When are our students learning well? So academics are saying when they see successful assessment, developing skills, communication, technical skills, discussion in person, online, teaching each other, engaging, interacting, contributing, reflecting. These are all the things that you would expect if your education system was really working. Imitating good practice via modelling, articulating ideas verbally, order knowledge, questioning, critiquing, linking theory and practice, reflecting and practising, asking questions of uh, questions, of literature in, oops. Why can't I go back? So um, essentially, basically, 
these are, these are the attributes that staff are saying that, the, this, is what, uh, that this is what they realise when our students are learning well. Thinking critically, laterally, synthesising, connecting ideas, bodies of knowledge. And these are all the things I think that come up time and time again. Now, um, one of the books that we've found quite interesting when we've been looking at this, uh, or trying to develop this uh, strategic blueprint was the conversational framework from uh, Diana Laurelard. Uh, this is the learner learning, thinking, being, supported and acting. And essentially, Laurelard says in her book, basically that in the e-learning domain, all this is, is, is equally important as it is in face-to-face. -face. And so, in delivering e-learning, you have to...